so thank you all. I hope you can see my presentation. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, this, so this is rebooting language, and I got a paper here to present that is not actually just about language, but about interaction. The main thing here is interaction. So this is a study. It's it made the empirical work is made by my former PhD student Liz Alvardsen, and we've written the paper together, and it's in the sort of paper in progress. Uh, so this is about uh, we call it constructing organizational reality. So we're looking at some, something small and we're making a big argument out of it, and we're we're arguing that this matters a lot. So what are we looking at, and what are, what is it that we want to do? The background for this is that we're looking at collective action, and we argue that to be able to, to do some kind of collective action, we need, we, the collective that is acting, need some kind of awareness and identification that we are a collective. And we utilize the notion of identification to sort of address this question of identification. Now, in an organizational context, this kind of shared identification to identify us as a we is challenged by organizational complexity quite generally, and in particular distributed collaboration that is working in uh, online like we are doing now. Um, and our basic question here is what then is the role of leadership as a process, not as a position, not as a person, but as a process in mobilizing and facilitating team identification? That is our research question. So background, uh, the theoretical basis for this, team identification is a concept that is utilized, for instance, in social identity theory, where the social identity is a part of an individual self-concept. So it's an individual, uh, cogn mainly cognitive uh, uh, phenomenon, and it, it concerns the question of which groups am I a member of, as opposed to personal identification that has to do with who am I in and of myself, so to speak. However, we look at identification here not as a cognitive phenomenon or an individual internal phenomenon, but as an interactional practice. So we're looking at the way that people cast themselves and others in categories as part of ongoing interaction. And then that is verbal and multimodal. So it's categorization in action. Now, those kind of categories that we utilize and are cast in are associated with a range of interesting and important characteristics. First and foremost, they're associated with rights and obligations. And those, again, they're enacted with, it's something you do. For instance, a team leader, somebody who is identified as a team leader and who self-identifies as a team leader and is seen as a team leader by others, um, then sort of is seen to have the rights to speak on behalf of the team and also a range of obligations in relation to the team. This is not a formal agreement or the point of it is not this formal agreement. Those are the expectations that we hold in relation to that category as that is sort of played out in, in, in live interaction. So, and then we are arguing that this is a way to look at the present social reality, that the collective that is alive that is the one you identify with. So even if we're looking at a team, we're looking at a team that is an organizational entity, there's a formal structure called a team, but we're looking here at how that formal structure, so to speak, comes alive and becomes the lived social reality. And the notion of team identification is the concept that captures that sort of coming alive when it's consequential. It is the collective we are acting on behalf of or in relation to. Leadership then. Um, leadership, two versions of leadership. One comes from social identity theory, where we tend to see leadership as an emergence, emergence as a consequence of group identification. And then we have the functional leadership tradition uh, that also sees leadership as a group function, that was supplying what is needed for group work. Now, both of these strands as sort of examples, they, they assume that there is a group and that leadership resides on the foundation of an existing group. However, we're interested in the potential for leadership to establish that group in the first play, place, to make it come alive in the first place, rather than to just reside on the foundation of it being alive. 
Our perspective then, leadership as an infl interpersonal influence process, we are not, and it feels like it should emphasize that, we're not looking at persons, we're not looking at positions in a hierarchy, we're looking at this as an interpersonal influence process in the direction of organization relevant goals. This kind of perspective then makes it possible to explore the rather than to assume the function of formal roles. And this is, of course, then within the tradition of leadership in interaction. That's why we're working. The case we're looking at is virtual interaction, and we utilize two uh, concepts to, for, to, to, um, to, in relation to that that is, that is relevant. One is the co-located co teams, normal co-located teams. There, in the, in, in the life of co-located teams, there is an abundance of informal face-to-face -face interactions and their physical arrangements. And those uh, features facilitate team identification. It's sort of an automatic or semi-automatic process happening just because of this abundance of occasions to, to interact and, and also supported by the physical arrangements. However, in a distributed team, there is no, there's a lack of that kind of informal interactions. And there are no shared physical arrangements because the team is dis distributed at different geographical locations. And that makes a team as an identification target less salient and less visible. And identification becomes more dependent on formal meetings. That is often the only time the team is co-present as a team. So whatever identification happens needs, so to speak, to happen on those formal meetings. We differentiate between local space and virtual space. Local space, that is the uh, where people are sitting when we have a hybrid team, and virtual space is then the online, online um, environment. We're looking at recorded hybrid or virtual teams, and we're using conversation analysis. And uh, just skip over the details of that. We can look at it in, afterwards. This is a um, example of what happens. So we have the team. Uh, we have the co-located part of the teams in the image on the lower part of this, this slide. And what happens here is that people are saying or talking about a missing speaker and there's a lot of things going on. And in the yellow, um, yellow boxes, there are people speaking in Danish. The, the team is located in Denmark and the people present here are Danes. Uh, and they're talking about missing speakers, somebody lost it, yeah, somebody stole it. What happens here then is that we call subgrouping in local space. There's a number of features telling us that this team sort of teams up within this local space. There are overlapping turns, which is only possible within the local space. This kind of fast paced turn structure where people are talking simultaneously and co-constructing their, their, their uh, turns. The gazing towards each other, that is not possible in the virtual space. Uh, we cannot sort of have eye contact. And there's turn organization through a range of multimodal uh, resources, bodily movements and gaze and so on. Um, that makes the situated collection of participants in local space highly relevant as an identification category. And what we see is that people in action, so to speak, team up as a subgroup, the Danes or the people in the lo local group. Um, so there are two, two forms of subgrouping here. There are people in the local, co-located people in the same room, and the other one is people speaking Danish. And uh, these, these two groups are, of course, partly overlapping. That is what happens in almost all meetings that we have been observed. It happens temporarily, and it illustrates the fragility of the team identification. So the problem then becomes, so how, how can team identification be mobilized in this situation? Um, yeah, so what resources are utilized then to mobilize the whole team and what practices facilitate making the whole team relevant as an identification target in the face of this very frequent subgrouping process? Let's look at one example. This is what happens in the same team later on in another meeting. And uh, in the same meeting, but later on, they're talking about something uh, that comes from an employee survey. And it goes on like this. They're talking in the local space with the, the people who are co-located, and they keep sort of laughing. There's joking going on. What happens here in the green comments is that the team leader uh, begins to talk, look at the screen, 
and trying to, to sort of interrupt this uh, conversation in some sense. Uh, commenting on, I think we have some fun here. And one of the guys says, sorry, sorry. And he says, yeah, I guess it's difficult to sort of track and follow the discussion from you guys. Any inputs on any of these suggestions or things while he looks at the screen? After six uh, seconds, a participant from the virtual space, from online, uh, produce a, um, a, a comment, perhaps to the last one. So what we're looking at here is subgrouping in local space, quick turns and overlaps, and then we have the team leader oriented towards virtual space, gaze and body language, and addressing what goes on, making relevant the obligations towards the virtual space who have been eliminated from the discussion. And an uptake, dire directly addressing this, and in the end, an uptake. There is a pause that is respected as a pause, as if people are actually waiting for people in the virtual space to say something, which happens. So we have the whole team being made relevant as an identification category. Observations from this. There is a lot of subgrouping in local space, but there is also an orientation to the whole team through language use. People keep speaking English. Um, and with the influence processes, skipping to the influence processes and this, the team leader is persistent in highlighting the whole team. He keeps orienting towards member obliga obligations. We are having some fun here. He's verbally addressing challenges, making member obligations relevant again. Because there are challenges for people online, we who are in the same room would need to address that and be aware of that. The team leader seems actively oriented towards the whole team and in the end actually uh, succeeding in, in, uh, in making it uh, the relevant identity, making it come alive, so to speak. Okay, just skipping to uh, quickly to another resource that is utilized. We're looking at another team uh, and where the lead team leader is asking uh, questions from the video side, asking for input from the online participants. We got a pause, 9.2 seconds, which is very long. And then he says, I know you had that presentation by Jens in India. How did that go? OK, so what are we looking here? Looking at here, we're looking at the team leader first asking an open question, questions from the video part, getting no response. And then he utilizes the privileged knowledge from the role of team leader um, and ask more specifically about uh, input. He utilizes a specific Specified speaker selection targeting the category of India within the context of the whole team. And that, in the end, mobilizes people from India to speak up. Okay, so what we're looking at here is we're arguing, we're looking at how social reality is shaped through subtle moves. The whole team as an identification target is fragile in a virtual context. There is an abundance of competing identification targets. There is the difference, geographical locations, the different interactional environments in local space and virtual space. There are different um, geographical locations and different uh, contexts in a number of, uh, number of ways. What we see is that team, the, the identification with the team is, despite this, is accomplished again and again and again. But it is accomplished through ongoing and continuous work. That we might call identification work. So it is not something that is one, done once and for all. It is something that demands continuous work. The tactics that we can identify in these teams is, first of all, the role structure. The team leader is mobilized again and again and does, and does a lot of work in this. So here we see how the explicit and known obligation and rights are being mobilized. The team leader has, has obligations towards the whole team. And he, it's actually a man in all these teams, happens to be the only one who has known obligations towards the whole team. Uh, and these, these obligations, are, uh, we argue that these obligations are mobilized. And that's important. As the last example shows, he also has access to privileged knowledge through the hierarchy, which can be used to specify uh, speaker selection, which is helpful uh, to be able to, um, to mobilize uh, the, the whole team as an identification target. Um, there's also a number of other things, persistence, and we utilize the moral obligations. So in summary, 
What we argue that this kind of micro level detailed study shows is first of all influence as collaborative and asymmetrical. The, it's not symmetrical, it's not agentless, but it's neither individual heroism. It can never be achieved without uh, collaboration. It is situated, it is not a semi-stable configuration. It is always situated and it's different each time in some sense, even though the team leader is important. Explicit role assignments in ambiguous situations such as this, explicit role assignments bring category bound obligations that become, can become mobilized and are helpful to, to sort of counteract the ambiguity. Um, importantly, this has nothing to do with formal authority, but the obligations and the access to privileged knowledge, which can be used to mobilize the whole team. So we're looking at uh, the fact that the team leader as a role is important, but not because of formal authority, uh, but because of obligations towards the team. So we're also arguing then that leadership can actually bring a collective to life um, as a present and consequential reality. Um, and that's all of my slides, 33 slides actually. Brilliant timing. Thank you so much, Magnus. That was uh, a great presentation and very timely research. May I ask you a few words about the, uh, the while we were preparing to take some questions from the audience, may I ask you uh, some questions about critical material? I was wondering what kind of teams were these uh, people? Uh, have they always been working in the uh, in, in a remote way or in a, in, in a way in the format of a distributed team or if this is uh, what COVID brought them into? Uh, no, 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 it's pre-COVID. Um, this work was started before COVID and <laughs> as my, as, as Lisa, my co-author said that she hoped that once this would be very relevant and then COVID came and wow, poof. <laughs> That's the way it is. No, these and these are just you know organizational teams rather than project teams. So they are they are distributed geographically, but it's also that kind of matrix team. It, it's and one of the teams is, for instance, people who are responsible for security in oil. What do you call it? Oil rigs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, across the world. Uh, so there, there is not a line organization. It's it's typically a matrix. Um, Nature of function in an organization, which makes them even more fragile, of course. Yeah, I was always interested while I was uh, listening to your presentation. I was thinking about the case of Wikipedia as uh, again as as a company, as the organization where everyone works remotely, and this is the philosophy of uh, of the company. I wonder if this practice that they would have to create the team identity uh, would it be different from first of all other tech organizations which exist and also from the the companies that would have uh, hybrid way of, ways of working thank you so much very interesting johan you have a question yes okay your turn you know, so I had to fiddle a bit. Yeah, Magnus asked me a very evil question during my presentation earlier today, so I'll have to excite my revenge now. Uh, and I, therefore, I will call what you are doing baboon science, Magnus. Baboon uh, science. By a baboon science, yes. Uh, that was actually a coin, uh, a term coined by Bruno Latour um, when reflecting over how baboons reproduce. Uh, hierarchical patterns through constant interaction, through grooming and other activities, whereas humans, we usually don't have to do that because we have established, we have ways of stabilizing our authority relationships. So that is Latour's argument that we shouldn't study humans as if they were baboons. We need to look at these stabilizing mechanisms. And you're saying that formal authority doesn't play a part, but I'm and then you talk about obligations towards the team. I would say that formal authority is exactly a way of stabilizing such obligations towards the team. So by making a rather artificial distinction between obligations and formal authority, you are being a bit baboonish, if you like, in your approach here. Well, I I don't think baboons use teams. Uh, so maybe it's better to be a baboon. 
I don't know. So no, and I don't I mean uh, when we're talking about authority, we're talking about um, typically. I mean, uh, uh, having to having somebody do something that they wouldn't do otherwise, so some kind of power relationship. What we're talking about here is the obligations that I have towards a collective in this sense, the team. It is not something to do with um, why you follow me. It is something to do with why do I care about you being silent. Yeah, so, but wouldn't the formal position of being a team leader carry with it such obligations? Exactly, that's the point. The form, they can be. I mean, there are many roles. A formal team leader is one. The, the chair is another one that is a very important and interesting um, uh, role you can utilize. You can also have other, other roles, of course. Those are the two most common. The point is, when you have an explicit role, um, and, and there are studies of that, of course, um, when you have an explicit role, that, that that role comes with some kind of obligations as expectations. And when those are in relation to the team, the whole team, well, that's a resource in, in some sense in the interaction. And that's what we're pointing at. That resource is mobilized. Uh, yeah. So formal authority is there, but not. It is not a question of, of commanding or through authority making the team identification present. It's a question of other other things going on, trying to make it present. Authority would would have to do have to do with why the other people sort of um, follow suit, why the other people relate to the whole team as an identification target. And we could argue, of course, that there's an element of authority in that. I wouldn't know how to tease that out. Um, analytically in this work, but I mean, yeah, it's it's not it's not what strikes us at least. People do not relate to the whole team because of the authority of the former leader, but because of other things. Fair enough. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, makes me think about the seminars and teaching, and you know, I, I know that this is this is the situation when you definitely do have the formal authority, but could be very useful to to adjust your finding into the teaching practice when you run a seminar online and you want to you know to engage everyone. Do you yeah. have any other questions from 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 the audience, Doris? You have your camera on. Would you like to comment and add? Uh, I was just trying to be polite having my camera on, particularly <laughs> after Magnus felt, um, you know, it's not, uh, he, he doesn't want to look at just um, uh, names on, on, on the screen. <clears throat> comment from me. Oh, there's actually uh, a comment from Steve Allen before I jump in. Okay. That first? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, say, thank you very much for your presentation. He's wondering about the significance of these moments that have been analyzed. How are they selected? And how are these moments understood in relation to the team development slash identity uh, slash effectiveness? Or is that not important for the leadership perspective that you are seeking to develop? That's a good question. So there are two questions, right? One analytical, right? How do we identify these moments? Yeah, um, th that's a very long answer. I could produce a very long answer to that. But essentially, it's a question of identifying moments in these 54 meetings, more than 54 hours, where subgrouping is prevalent and obvious, and and where it is sort of there's a, there's a phase of subgrouping happening and they're coming out of it in some sense. And what happens in that some sense? Those, that, that's the mechanism for identifying those moments and then scrutinizing them, close analysis of them. So we're looking at those sort of in, interesting moments when the team falls apart, visibly falls apart, so to speak, and then something is, is happening in that. OK, so then you're asking about team development. Well, well basically, this is an argument for fragility and the temporality of organizations. That, that there's nothing stable unless it is stabilized. And stabilization is an ongoing continuous process. That, that's, that's, a, that's a powerful, that's a strong argument. There is nothing being there unless we hold it in place. Very much so in this kind of situation where there is ambiguity and, and broadly speaking complexity. Um, efficient, effectiveness and efficiency, well, I wouldn't know how to study that. 
I wouldn't even know. And not 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 least in these kinds of teams, I, I don't know what that would mean even. Um, yeah. We, we're focusing on these moments, right? Moments um, where, where things happen and where we can see influence in play. It, at moments where influence is actually happening, and then we're trying to analyze the anatomy of those influence moments, so to speak, and see what, what resources and what practices and what processes might constitute leadership. And the assumption that leadership can shape social reality. Well, yeah, we're trying to look at it in detail. Not assume, but show. Great. Magnus, uh, have you been looking at the technology use in these different meetings? Was it was it similar in all cases, or maybe there was um, a uh, leadership innovation uh, in the way as uh, I don't know, using two screens during the meeting, adding people through the chat boxes, and you know, um, I don't know, adding an icon of of the team to uh, or uh, getting these Zoom backgrounds that were create the idea of the team, just fantasizing here. There's a lot of innovation going on. One of them is that they found out that they can turn on the cameras. And then, then they have more of a sense of who's online. I'm, I'm not joking, I'm not joking. So this pro, this, it's some kind of development going on. One of the most interesting things around technology is another paper that Liz has written with another, with a, another researcher about the role of technology. And, and the role of, of, of artifacts in producing this kind of influence. It's uh, published in leadership last year, I think. Mm -hmm. So yes, and, and so we're not looking at, and we're not assuming that, act, that leadership is performed by humans, but we are assuming that leadership is, is an interactional process in which technology can be very important. Artifacts can be very important, we're, but we are assuming that this is agential, there's agency in it. That's the, sort of the, the perspective. So not, we're not, not sort of uh, things don't do things, but things are used to do things. Makes sense. Tricky, Makes sense. Tricky distinction. Yeah, yes. Big, yeah, big big argument with the with the session is uh, 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 yesterday in as uh, uh, what things can and um, not do and how important are they for mm. the uh, examination of leadership. But Doris, uh, sorry again, I'm. Uh, That's is right. it? You right. I guess, Magnus, I've mentioned this, we, we've had these discussions before about, <laughs> you know, the, the, what I, what I always, and I guess this is maybe a little bit linked to what uh, Johan said earlier, but what, um, I'm always wondering with the particular, obviously, me me methodology that you use is what, what is hidden behind and, 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 and in between, you know, the the conversation um, and the the in in this particular case the the use of technology you know that that really I guess speaks to whether you know it is the 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 authorial power that is still still there or sits alongside the the dynamics in the meeting um, and or that you know has another level of of meaning for particular individuals, but also sub subgroupings. Um, and I think I've mentioned before to you that I think I think that <laughs> I always wonder where that goes, you know, yeah. mm. with, within these sort of analyses. Yeah, well, well <laughs> OK, so so you're, you're asking for a discussion that few, few years ahead, like um, so the short answer would be, well, yeah, we can always look behind. We can also look at what is visible. Uh, and and we, we're sort of making a choice in it. And then we can also always interpret what goes on in terms of something that we cannot see. Uh, but we, we, th we, we, with our focus, it's an analytical focus, but it's also an ontological assumption that, that, that reality is real. And, and it's visible, otherwise it wouldn't make a difference, so to speak. We're not, we assume that what people think doesn't make any difference in, at all in interaction. It only makes a difference if it's visible to other people, displayed in some sense. And those, those displays are subtle. That's why the recordings and the very, 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 very close analysis is, is paramount. We need to do that. We, we, we cannot claim to capture everything, but we can try and understand and ask the question, why, why, did, I mean, why did this happen in the sense of what are people orienting towards and looking at what happens in interaction? 
And what happens in interaction is never people think, people mean, people intend, is also always people do. So we can only look at what people do. But that, that's an argument that can get us a long way towards understanding what, what goes on without utilizing too much abstract uh, interpretations. I mean, we can do that as well, but we're looking at the, uh, what actually happens in the interaction. Yeah. It's more like microscopic than, than, than yeah. zooming out. <laughs> but in the, and that's the argument. In the microscopic, yeah. organizations are created and social worlds yeah. are created. Yeah. It's, not, it's not myoptic, no. Fair enough. <laughs> we keep having that one, yes. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yes. Right, does anyone have anything to add here? Or um, should we thank uh, Magnus and then go to the next speaker?